right, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, well, as you know, the Prime Minister is out of state attending the CARICOM Heads of Government um, meeting. So, um, should be back on Thursday and he will resume his duties as Prime Minister. I think there's a lot we can talk about this morning, but I'll probably let you start by asking any questions that you may have. Sure. Uh, my question is literally about the boundaries. Um, kind of heard from the new constituencies. I'm not sure if it's a new thing. Yes, it's a new thing. Possibly. Possibly. You're throwing me out? Possibly. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Right. So I just wanted some kind of information on that. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, in 2016, um, there was a proposal from the Constituency and Boundaries Commission um, to alter the boundaries in St. Lucia. As you know, the Constitution provides that I think every seven years there should be a review and recommendations made for the establishment of constituency boundaries in St. Lucia. Um, a proposal was adopted then by the Commission, supported by both parties. In 20, um, before the 2016 election, I think it was in 2015. Subsequent to that, former representative Guy Joseph um, did file a, a motion against it, saying that it was going to prejudice him. Um, the, the case has gone on. The, first, there was a procedural motion, um, which he, he lost eventually. And the case itself, the substantive case, has still not been heard yet. But of course, since then, seven years has passed, because that was 2015, and th th there was supposed to be another review in 2022. So because the Constitution says no more than seven years, you have to do a review of the, the boundaries. We've not had boundary changes in St. Lucia for 50 years. Just think about that. F the last major, major change we had was in 1974 when we moved from um, 10 constituencies to 17. Um, we've had little realignments along the way. So we are due um, for a review of the constituency boundaries. And like I said, the, it's on the table. Um, there are discussions taking place as to what the boundaries should be. Um, if you just imagine, Grosile is by far the largest constituency. Grosile is many times the size of Denry South um, and certainly larger than the, the next largest, which I think is Castries South East. I think the, the largest constituencies are Grosile, South, Castries South East, Castries East, Barbono, in terms of population size. So there, there has to be. So I guess once the census report is released and will give us a sense of what the population spread is, because according to the constitution, it's not voters. Is the population of the districts, not voters, not registered voters, population of the districts. So once we get the census report, we can then decide what's the best arrangement. And the constitution says you should try to approximate equal number in every constituency, subject to population, transportation network, and a number of criteria. But it really calls upon you to have as equal as possible um, the number of people um, living in a constituency and we know you're totally off because grossly by itself um, is the size of many other constituencies so yes the answer is you, we have to do it constitutionally to review the, con the boundaries can we say that happening before the next election and what are the concerns from the current administration um, as it relates to you know, how would that affect the well, well, it's up to the commission. The, the commission comprises, you know, um, five persons chaired by the speaker and, you know, two nominated by the leader of the opposition, two by the, the prime minister. And they will decide and they will advise parliament to, well, through the speaker. So if they decide there should be no changes, there will be no changes. And if they decide there should be changes, um, it will be presented to the House for debate and we can or not accept what they recommend. So, um, concerns from a party perspective on the if it's proposed that um, Grosley is to be um, separated in two, three, four, Castry South is um, Castry South, um, mm. Castry South is 
um, bodily concerns um, as the deputy? Well, I have no concerns, really. I mean, elections are elections to be fought. And if, you, if, they, if they reduce um, constituencies, if they increase it, that's just what's before you. And you have to deal with it. Um, you know, only recently I was watching news in England. In fact, there was just a by-election in England two weeks ago. And if you do some research on it, that constituency will not exist in the next in the general election because of the realignments that will take place in England. So imagine somebody winning a seat two weeks ago who need to be told by the time they call the general election, your constituency will no longer exist. But that's the reality. So no matter what comes before us, we have to deal with it. As political parties, you strive to win as many seats as you can, and that's just what it is. Uh, some, some of the would, would worry about um, gerrymandering. I'm thinking that you know, people might cut it just to favor political parties. And what would you say to that? No, we don't believe in gerrymandering. In case it's a commission that has to make the recommendation, and the, the commission has to present a viable you know, um, proposal which has to be debated by the House and that report um, has to be made public. So if somebody says, you know, um, take out this area from that area and put it in another area, but well, we, we've had gerrymandering in the past in St. Lucia. I mean, if you, if you look at some constituencies, PAI sometimes has been in Labry, and sometimes has been in um, Srozel. For Jacques has swung. I mean, there have been attempts to take out certain communities and put them in certain constituencies to try to sway the, the voters. But generally in Senusha, we don't have gerrymandering. We don't have that. We've had a very, very distinguished record when it comes to voting and change of government. Um, and I, I think we will certainly want to see that tradition kept alive in St. Lucia, that if there are going to be changes to the constituencies, that the proper report is prepared by the commission and submitted to Parliament for this for debates. Would you say there's been some economic factors involved? I mean, so from 74, there has been a major change in the world, so much so. And then what is it that has been more than progress? Well, I, I just think we've not been true to the, the, the Constitution. And, and it's, this is exactly the point that was made. Governments might have been afraid that people will consider it gerrymandering and that you are changing it just to favor you. Um, but that's not what it should be. The Constitution says no more than seven years every year, every cycle. We have to review it. It doesn't say we have to make changes, but we have to review, um, and therefore we should do so. Um, that's what the Constitution requires, because a constituency that has you know fifty thousand people, you know, as against another that has nine thousand people, there's a vast difference. Um, so, so that court case with the opposition. No, it, it, I, I started off making the point that no matter what happens to that case, the seven-year cycle has is back on because it says no more than seven years. So, if, if the last change was proposed in 2015, we're supposed to have another seven years would be 2022. So we should have had already a review by the commission. It's overdue. But it says no more than seven years. So it, it's overdue already. We have to do it. Um, a number of airlines are planning to increase FA, I think, um, particularly from the European market for the summer. Um, what are the concerns from a touristic, uh, tourism perspective? How will that affect, um, if any, um, how will that affect visitor arrivals to St. Lucia, considering the successes we've had in um, record numbers? Well, I think, you know, as an industry that has some sensitivity to price, um, any significant increase in price will affect demand, and especially if you're speaking about Europe which is going for its own economic challenges, particularly the United Kingdom, where inflation has not been reduced as quickly as other parts of the world, um, there, there will always be um, some effect. And as much as individuals are traveling like never before, especially since COVID, and it continues to, to, to grow, you know, they, there's only so much people can take. Because, you know, especially when it comes to family travel, you know, a, a family of six, 
traveling for the summer vacation. An increase of 100 pounds per person is an increase of 600 pounds, really. Uh, and it, it will have its effect. And of course, some of the room rates are also increasing. If you compare the room rates now to what they were before COVID, they too have increased. So you can understand the challenges people will face for traveling now. Um, so we will always be watching very closely um, those developments. Already the, the rates to St. Lucia, the FS to St. Lucia are high. Um, but it reflects a lot the demand for the destination and the, the whole question of supply of equipment and, and crew and whatnot. So yes, we will always be concerned. What are we doing to push in the flow to ensure that you know, um, it does not affect us significantly. Well, I, I think there, there has to be a discussion of all stakeholders in terms of how can each contribute to make sure that Central remains competitive. Um, remember, you know, in terms of just basic um, economics, you know, you, you want to remain competitive. Uh, and therefore, you have to always figure out that you cannot allow yourself to fall out of or, or the competitive range. And therefore, the, any thinking and response has to be to make sure that you know we are still in the forefront as a destination of choice. In the regions, um, the regional I think St. Lucia has stated publicly its position is that we support all the private sector and public sector initiatives to improve connectivity in the region. And as a government, we are committed to supporting connectivity of the region. And once there is placed before the government a viable initiative, we will be prepared to support it. There are plans for a ferry service to connect to Barbados, Trinidad. And I think Diana as well. Um, for several years, there have been proposals, several proposals to connect St. Lucia and St. Vincent. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any plans to, to have something like that to connect to the two islands? Are you aware of anything that is? Proposed? Yeah, there, there, there was a, a, a study done by the OECS. And at the last meeting I attended, the OECS Ministers of Tourism, and the next meeting will be in the next um, two to three weeks or so, where we act, the OECS actually identified ferries that can be used to have that, that connectivity. So um, I will get an update at the next meeting. Um, the issue was the financing of the, 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 um, the ferries. So we will be um, looking at that. Yes. Any plans to make the well not make but the, the escalated crime area designation that you put last year? Can we see that happening in the Viewfort? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the Minister of National Security will be advised by um, the police and other security um, you know personnel as to what's the best response. And I think we must always make the point. Always make the point. As a government, our position is clear. We are policy, the police is operation. The police decides what is the best responses from a law enforcement perspective that, is, that are needed from time to time based on the challenges. Our response was to make sure they have the resources and the capability and the support to make it happen. So, you know, if it reaches a point where the police believes X, Y, and Z should be done, as mentioned by you, it is for ourselves as policymakers to respond and support them. Um, we cannot tell the police what their operational responses should be. We can share the concerns of citizens with them. We can share with them the, 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 the feeling that our population, the citizens, are, are expressing, and to ensure we push them to... To, to, to undertake the tasks in the most efficient and effective manner. Um, and therefore, the government continues to do so. But we, you will not see us as a government, you know, operationalizing what has to be done. Um, that, that's not our responsibility per se. But trust me, we are citizens and, and we have constituents and they speak to us. And we have to be able to say to the police, this is what, you know, our constituents are saying to us. This is what the public is saying and for us to hear from them what are their responses and how they're going to deal with the situation. So we will continue to push the police 
to take the strongest possible action necessary to ensure that we have you know safety and security in this country and we operate you know within the bonds of of, of law and we will always want to protect that but the police has to respond and ensure that our citizens feel safe in this country. Within the second half of last year, um, it was noted by the, the Prime Minister and Minister for National Security that um, we have seen a decline in the military. Mm -hmm. um, it was attributed to well, the actions taken by the, the police and I guess the contributions from government to mm -hmm. support their, their work. Um, so then from since then, what has happened in the first two months of this year that is it that they need to change? Did they change something? Or what is happening? I, f I think it's best for the police hierarchy to deal with those operational matters. Um, I can tell you that the government continues to provide all the support necessary to the police, and the police can rest assured, and the public can rest assured, that the government is always willing to provide the resources and the support needed for them to be able to do their work. And all they need to do is to indicate to us what their needs are, and we will step up and provide it. But in terms of what may have happen or what's happening, I think it would be best if I leave it to the police to, to, to address those issues. Minister, on the issue of crime, um, we understand that the police had an operation in Newport and we learned this morning in a news report that um, police came under, not gunfire, but projectiles were sent after them and so they had to seek refuge. Is the government concerned? Well, I, I read a story which has carried in the Loop News. news. And I must say it's a shameful story. Um, I think the image that is created and presented to the public is a little outrageous. It's just not um, true from all the reports that we've gotten, and I've gotten a briefing from the police as to what happened, and I think the story was really exaggerated. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, as much as um, persons want to make sure they can exercise their right to carry news and to present to the public what's happening in the country, we must also be mindful that how we write and how we express it can be harmful as well. And I am not taking anything away from the reporter who, who, who wrote it and, and the intent of the reporter, because they probably uh, have no reason to believe there was any intent to be malicious. But when you read the story, the story speaks about the police was under attack while they undertaking an operation and that the situation rapidly escalated and it gives you the impression that the police was undertaking an operation that the public and the citizens of Bruceville attacked the police throwing projectiles on them and they had to retreat and, and that's not true that is not true from all the reports we have and all the evidence I have seen the police undertook an operation and the police exited the, 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 the site in exiting Somebody threw a projectile, it may be two, I was told one, and it, you know, struck the police vehicle. I think it landed in the back of the police vehicle. There was no public that attacked the police. There was no escalation and there was no retreat by the police. I can tell you, I would be very disappointed. I'm sure the Prime Minister and the government would be very dis disappointed if that had happened the way it was described in, in, in the story. And I think it's very unfortunate. That, that, that loop carried a story like that. And like I said, I'm not taking anything and not trying to present the intent of the reporter as anything else, but trying to carry the story in the best manner that he thinks. But it is wrong, and it should not be done in that way. And I think I have an issue with loop news. Last week I had reason to complain about loop news carrying a story that there was a travel advisory from the Canadian government against St. Lucia. That was not true. Now you'd wish and you'd hope that loop news is not going to descend into the depths of you know misinformation and just sensationalizing everything for the sake of creating you know I don't know if, if it's fear or if it's whatever but it's just totally unnecessary and I have a difficulty that we are facing challenging times the media is supposed to carry information the media is supposed to let the citizens know what's happening in the country but equally it has a responsibility to carry the stories in a manner which you know best portrayed what happened and certainly not to create unnecessary sensationalism and i think that's what has happened i think that's what loop has found itself doing um, 
you know, on the last two occasions. And I want to appeal to, to look news to at least pay regard to the, the huge responsibility that they have on their shoulders as part of our democratic country. I mean, we, we, we are based on the, the free speech, on the right to persons conveying their, their, their sentiments and you know, expressing their opinions. But let's also be mindful of the consequences of how we do it. This one was totally unnecessary. And again, I repeat, it was not true. That is not how it happened. And if you want to write it like a cowboy a novel, the challenges we're facing in this country does not require us to be so lax, you know, the latitude that we have um, when it comes to freedom of speech and freedom of expression of, the, of opinions. So the police were able to carry out the operation they had set out? The operation had ended. The police were leaving. The, the operation was never inhibited or hindered in any way. And that's from the information I have gotten and the evidence that was presented to me. So, you know, the police was not stopped. And, and it's also a, a very poor reflection too on the... I mean, we know Bruceville has its challenges and its responsibilities, but if you read that story, you'll get the impression that the citizens of Bruceville are just a set of lawless people. That even when the police come to try and put order in their community, they're attacking the police. That's how it comes across. So it's also unfair to the residents of Bruceville. And already they're facing very difficult times. They are traumatized by what's going on around them. To now present them to the rest of St. Lucia as residents who attack the police that come to put law and order in their own community. Think about that. What are you doing to an already traumatized community? The, the, the police will deal with it in the appropriate law enforcement um, practice. Deputy Prime Minister, you just spoke about the trauma in which crime could mm -hmm. cause the impact it could have on the community. In wake of the rising gun violence, if you could appeal to the perpetrators of these crimes, what would you say? Well, I, I think we need to, to, to make it very clear that. Um, you know, we have to understand the impact that crime has on our society. We need to be very clear that for our country to move forward, for us to ensure that our citizens can live civilized standards of living, that our society can develop, we need to ensure citizen safety. And the persons that are involved in criminal activity should take note that we are not going to surrender. We're not going to. It is challenging, it is difficult, but we're not going to give in. Because to do so is to lose our country, to lose exactly who we are as a people and what we, what we exist for. So we have to control it. And persons that are involved in crime should take note that we're not going to surrender. It's not going to be easy. And certainly not when you have stories like what Loop News carries. It's not going to be easy. But we are going to fight and we are going to to ensure that law-abiding citizens in this country can feel safe. And we are going through difficult times, but we are going to win this battle. This is not just about us. That's for the generations to come as well. Because if we cannot stop it now, think of what's going to happen in years to come. Think about it. So persons who are involved in criminal activity cannot be seen as our allies. They cannot be seen as persons that should get a free pass. They have to be held accountable, and we must support the police to make sure they have the capacity to be able to deal with those situations. I mean, all social problems individuals have, there must always be a way in which government can support them to ensure we address it. I'm not saying people don't have social problems, but we have to find a way as a government, as a society, to address those uh, you know, social problems. But it cannot descend into total lawlessness and chaos. We will not allow that to happen. Okay. Um, um, as the broadcast minister of the information and distribution, um, a bunch of questions. Well, a few questions you asked, and you said you would leave it up to the police to respond. However, when we do reach out to the police for that information, we do not get that information. So, is it for national security reasons they're not giving it? I'm not too sure. Because you, 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 you also have to be sensitive to the fact that there's not 
not everything can be shared because well, not just that, but sometimes responses they have to be very they have to be very um, aware of what they say. And again, like I said, you know, maybe to engage them to also find out um, what are the limitations in sharing information. But I can convey to the police your sentiments that you you believe as the media they need to be more forthcoming with information. No, no, that's different. That one, that, that one is a rush to be first. Okay. Uh, uh, let, 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 me, let, me, let me tell you what happened. It's a rush to be first and also a desire to be the most dramatic. No, no, it, it's true. That, that, let me tell you, it's exactly that. You know, it's almost, I, I don't want to dis describe it any, any further than that, you know. Um, maybe, but you don't, there's no need to rush to be first. But in the media, you understand why that's done. Nobody wants the other station to carry the story first. And nobody wants to carry a story that appears to be boring. So you want to be dramatic and you want to present. When you read the headlines, you woke up this morning, you saw those headlines. What? You, you rush in to read. First line, police was under attack. What? You want to read, you know, but there's no need for that. The, the emitter, this is different. This is life and death. This is the destruction of our society. This is not a cricket match where you want to see how brilliant was a shot of a football game, how glorious was the free kick. That's not what it's about. This is life and death. So, but in everything that we said, um, police, like she said, this may be the reason why we get um, this this issues. Um, yes, the media has a responsibility. Um, I think last week I asked you about the Freedom of Information Act and, and the need for the sharing of information from government agencies. Mm -hmm. Critical, I think, operation was um, done last week when we saw the 12 guys being apprehended, being charged with four one hood actually. Um, which and it tells a bigger story of, of the gang warfare that's going on in, in this land. At this point, with everything that's happening, we, we see the country at 90 murders. This is unprecedented, of us. Um, and it's something that, that is scary. And, and conversations with the people, especially those in the South, who not just um, seeing murders, but the fact is there's always this shootouts happening, though people may not be injured or may be injured, right? Is, is there a time, is, is this not the time to really engage the media in getting certain information out? For example, 12 guys were arrested. Who are these 12 guys? We don't have a face to put to all these names, right? We see the victims, but who are the people who are doing the things we don't see it? There's a law allow for that to there's, be there. The law I, I, I don't know. The it, issue is, from what I, what I have learned, is this is um, a, a failure on the part of... Um, the, the institutions themselves... Okay, so you're saying to me, uh, help me understand it, yeah. right? because I can't pretend I know yeah. the thing. So if somebody is charged and bail, you're saying the media should get the photo of the person to be able to show that person... Once the individual is, is charged... You have to. I think the... No thing, no thing. No. Tell me. Okay, based yeah. on based on the, the, the last police press conference, mm. that issue came up, and um, based on what the police has said... Um, you cannot identify individuals unless they are formally charged for um, mm -hmm. obvious mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you know yeah. obvious reasons. You know. But however, even after these individuals are charged, we don't get a uh, mug shot or. or All right. So what what, what I can do what I can do <laughs> is arrange for the police to have a session with you, and let's establish. Um, let's establish an understanding of how we deal with those issues. Because trust me, I myself am a citizen, huh? and sometimes I want to to know more than what I read, especially when I read local news. I, I always want to know if I'm reading the truth, um, you know. So you you can imagine, um, you know. I, I agree with you. We can have a very clear, and I would suggest it to the. Um, Minister of National Security when he comes back and to the police commissioner to sit with the media and almost have a working session of how do we address those issues because the, the, the first two broadcasts and the most dramatic story can't really work for us. Um, uh, can I take the last question because I have sure. cabinet. And the constituency of a, a port of entry, you mm. know, international airport is down there. Is there anything additional that is being done that you know of, mm. um, maybe in your portfolio as Minister of Tourism, to protect our visitors in particular? Because, I mean, 
yeah. with all the crime in that era. I mean, you can't. Yeah, do I mean, put it that way. Based on the characteristics of what's happening, we don't see a threat. We don't see it involved. In it. it seems to be very particular in what's happening. But we're not taking chances, and I, I announced recently that we are going to reactivate the Rangers unit to make sure that you know certain areas in St. Lucia are protected, the beaches, the areas where we have mass crowd events and whatnot, um, just to you know be proactive. But you know the characteristics of what's happening um, are such that you know it's not spilling over into those areas. It's very localized with its own dynamics uh, but you are right we are already thinking of taking actions and you will see um, certain actions being um, undertaken thank you very much and my look friend my very good friend um, <laughs> yeah. um, so how are this um, which has been affecting us um, what, what would you like to say to you know, the solution public in terms of um, taking the necessary precautions to prevent illness and, and all that, and your concerns? Well, the, the doctors, medical professionals, and, and those who work at the hospitals and the wellness centers over the last few weeks have really been um, sounding the alarm about the possible negative effects of the Saharan dust and um, the, the chief medical officer and her office, they've also put out a number of, of, of bulletins and also warnings, so to speak, about what we should do to protect ourselves, wearing of masks, avoiding um, certain conditions, especially if you're out in the open, um, to protect yourself from, from excessive exposure to the Saharan dust. And um, these warnings continue. I think you will recall that the chief medical officer and other health professionals have also warned, especially those who have respiratory problems, um, to avoid, to do the best that they can to avoid exposure. So it, again, it's, it's a general warning that goes out um, almost every week, and we are hoping that individuals continue to, to adhere because it, it, it is posing a problem, especially to individuals who already have um, respiratory issues. The issues with crime, um, I'm, I'm sure, pose a significant stress on our health sector. Um, speak to those challenges and, and what additional resources have been put in place maybe to help resolve that? Well, certainly, the, the, the issues with violence and, and crime continue to pose um, immense pressures on the, on the medical. Continue to pose pressures. Um, just a few days ago, I visited some of the doctors and some of the nurses at the St. Jude Hospital, um, especially in, in the emergency department. I wanted to speak with them myself to, of course, express um, support and solidarity. And the, the reports that are coming out of the hospital clearly indicate that they are under pressure. Um, you can well imagine when you have incidents of violence, whether it be in VA4, in Castries, or Soufre, or Denry, the nurses and doctors at the medical facilities are the ones, um, together with the fire service and the police, they are the ones who have to face those situations firsthand. So in addition to the, the, the pressures on pharmaceuticals and, and the professionals, the fatigue and so on, you also have the mental, the mental situation, the, the, you know, the mental wellness. And clearly, the doctors, nurses, um, those who work as security professionals at the hospitals, those who work in um, the, the professionals who do the cleaning and so on, all of it really adds pressure, not just, as I said, on the, the technical expertise and the clinical expertise, but our mental wellness, the mental wellness of, of the professionals. What are we doing? I can tell you that in the case of the St. Jude Hospital, over the last couple of days last week, additional security um, was placed at the St. Jude Hospital. We wish to thank the, the, the Special Services Unit of the, of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. They reacted swiftly to provide additional service. I also visited the, the Viewfort Wellness Center, 
and had a discussion with Nurse Duncan, who showed me a, a particular area where you can see clearly that um, there, there are marks of, of, you know, obviously the result of, of, of incidents, people running around um, with, with implements and tools and that kind of thing. So clearly it is, it is, a, it is a very grave concern to the ministry and to the government. You have heard the Prime Minister speak about the impact of violence on, on the health sector. And recently, the St. Lucia Medical and Dental Association did put out a statement about the impact of violence on nurses, doctors, people who clean the hospital, security, everybody, the health aides, everybody. It's really a serious problem. And we are working um, both on the security front in terms of additional security, but also on the wellness front. What can we do to, to, to enable the doctors and the nurses and everybody who work in those situations to, to have a better grip on, on their own mental health. When I visited the St. Jude Hospital a few days ago, I saw Dr. Swami, and um, he did um, pledge the support of, of the team um, to having um, some sessions with our professionals. So yes, it is an issue, and it is one that we are working with the professionals to deal with. Is crime being um, addressed um, with great um, urgency? When compared to how um, COVID was dealt with, you know, we saw the PSCs and a number of other initiatives, um, public awareness campaigns, that sort of thing. Um, but we don't, we're not seeing the same reflected as it relates to you know, with crime. Well, clearly, and the Prime Minister would have, you know, spoken about this many, many times, what the government is doing to address crime clearly we have to operate on many different fronts. One of the most important things have to do with support for the police. And the record of this government in relation to support for the police is very clear and very visible. There are other aspects, obviously, um, social aspects and, and other things that have to be done. The Ministry of Health, Wellness and Elderly Affairs, all the agencies obviously have to pull together. Um, but this is clearly um, fundamentally a, an issue of security and an issue of, of citizen security and safety for our residents and the government um, has done quite a bit to to cause there to be change in terms of resources to the police um, training and and so on many areas of that that were neglected you can see that the government um, clearly has worked to improve these areas we see violent crime continuing and that continues to be a major issue for the government and obviously the citizens i'm from i'm from v4 and um although I, i'm the rep for v4 north I mean, I spent most of my, my early years in the town of Viewfort, and I know Viewfort very well. I'm from Viewfort, and clearly all the people of Viewfort and the people of St. Lucia continue to be very concerned about what is happening, and I can, I can tell you that the government, too, is extremely concerned and working with the security agencies and working with the other partners to ensure that there is an abatement um, to this to this situation. Your question may, may be related more directly to the Ministry of Health, Wellness and Elderly Affairs. And I'm sure you recall that um, if you speak of PSAs, you recall there are several PSAs that the Ministry has put out on the issue of violence and how it impacts um, wellness and how it impacts the hospitals and so on. That is something possibly we need to do more of. But yes, there are PSAs and um, I can ask the staff to to send you those PSAs and um, certainly everyone certainly can do more but um, the government is taking it seriously and we are working with the agencies. Um, recently this uh, uh, I think the child uh, of a centenarian who was a patient at UKE, she called the talk show, she was complaining about um, uh, well, her mother having to pay the bills for her stay. Um, I know we had the Golden AC program. Could you again just enlighten us as to what is covered under this program and who is covered? Okay, um, let me just go over it again. Um, the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and Elderly Affairs has addressed this matter, but uh, in, you know, briefly I will go over it. The 80 plus program is uh, it targets individuals who are 80 years and, and older, and what it does, it supplies or it offers to these individuals medical attention at our health and wellness centers throughout St. Lucia, the Grocery Polyclinic, 
medi pharmaceuticals, doctors' visits, and pharma especially pharmaceuticals when they are available. We know that in the initial in the initial announcement, the, in the intention was always for these people to get medical care throughout the health system. We did come out to say that the work with the hospitals continue because before we can extend the service to the hospitals, we must ensure that we have all the financials in relation to the visits of the 80 plus individuals at the hospitals. Are they going for cancer treatment? Are they going for surgeries? Are they going for major medical interventions? And therefore we will have to obviously prepare in the budget allocations to deal with that as we have to pay the hospitals for those services. But all the other health and wellness centers, what we call the primary care centers, 80 individuals 80 years and over, do get these um, services without pain. Some individuals say to you, and I've heard it in the media, that oh, there was never a time when people pay for services at the health and wellness centers, and that was always free. That is not the case. In fact, our records show that individuals were 80 years and over, these individuals paid certain services and certain pharmaceuticals at the health and wellness centers to a tune of, to an amount of $1.6 million annually. So this $1.6 million annually, we have removed that burden from them. Now, there are cases when the individuals would go to the health and wellness centers and do not get a particular medication. Over the last few months, we had a challenge, and I did speak to this in the press, we had a challenge with diabetic and hypertensive um, medication. And that had to do with, with supply chain issues. It had to do with, with you know, you paying for the medication and then we're not getting the medication on time. But we had some other processes and procedures which caused a lot of this medication to be distributed over the last few weeks. We do not have all of it yet, but something is being done to to ameliorate the situation and cause the situation to be much better. There are times when you don't get all of the medication, but this is the policy with the 80 plus in the upcoming budget. We should be in a situation in the upcoming budget to, to, to explain how we are going to extend the service. Again, all of this is within the, the, the understanding and, and, and trying to focus on the objective of universal health coverage, where incrementally we are introducing services to different parts of the population. We have said before as a government that we know we cannot implement universal health coverage one time in all departments for everybody. But at the same time, we are not waiting 10 years to begin to offer individual services simply because we do not have all the money to do all one time. That's why we started with um, maternal and child care. We had some challenges, but most of it is going very well, and we have the results to prove it. We have seen an increase of about 57% of individuals who are coming to the health and wellness centers to get their ultrasounds, um, to get coupons for the ultrasounds and the blood tests and so on. And we have also seen an increase in individuals accessing services for child and maternal and, and child care. As we move on to, to the next budget, you will see um, allocations for, for early cancer diagnosis different kinds of cancers. So our, our universal healthcare project is moving apace, and the 80 plus is, is a way of bringing in another group of individuals who did not get that service before. And I know there may be challenges, there are some challenges in some areas, but there was never this opportunity for individuals who are 80 years and over. So we have this opportunity now, and what we have to do is to ensure that it's working better and better as we go along. Before I go, before I go, I just want to mention, and I'll take the two questions, but I, before I go, I just want to again um, indicate that we have with us once again the U.S. military medical mission who are now at the Owen King EU Hospital. As we speak, they have started this morning, and they are, it is the U.S. military medical mission of the Lesser Antilles, the Lesser Antilles medical team. For short, we say LAMAT. And they are here again to perform surgeries free of charge to about 50 individuals, vascular surgeries, especially individuals who are on dialysis and so on. So that is another opportunity for our people to get medical care. And on behalf of the government, I really wish to thank um, the U.S. Military Medical Mission. And they will be here for, for a week, so I'm hoping that the press will have an opportunity to meet with them and to speak with them. I also want to say that um, last week we 
delivered many pieces of equipment and, and different supplies to the Rosanna Napoleon Medical Center at the Bodily Correctional Facility. And of course, I was asked by many individuals to explain why bodily? Why would the Ministry of Health, Wellness and Elderly Affairs um, have supply, medical supplies to bodily? Well, for the first time, we have a, a, a permanent, a, a doctor who is permanently stationed at the bodily medical facility. What does that mean and why is that important? It's important because if we have a well-established medical center at the bodily correctional facility, you can well imagine there'll be less pressure on the OKEU hospital. Because when you transfer um, inmates from bodily to OKEU or to St. Jude Hospital or to the Denry Hospital for medical care, 